Hey everybody, welcome to our live stream today. Uh, sorry for missing the last few Fridays. I had another bout of laryngitis, unfortunately, and uh, then a whole bunch of trips and everything else going on, so things were a little bit crazy. Let me go ahead and hand this off to our intrepid editor here who is assisting us with the live stream. One day, I swear, you will see her on camera. Um, so let's dive right on into the first question from Naveen here. Uh, I swear that there was a question earlier uh, that I am completely missing on the way that uh, YouTube has this live chat thing. Apologize for that YouTube live chat is really terrible. Uh, so the first question here is how do federal tax credits work on plug-in hybrids? Um, don't you pay the total cost of the hybrid, et cetera? So yes, so you pay for the car up front and then when you file your taxes, then you apply for the federal tax credit. That's why I always say that you should make sure uh, that you check with your tax professional to make sure the tax credits apply to you. So depending on your tax situation, you may not have a tax liability uh, large enough for you to get the full credit. So uh, especially if you're a young person, for instance, and you've just started working and you know it's the end of the year, for instance, this is your first job, you decide to buy a new, a new hybrid or a plug-in hybrid or an EV, and maybe you started your job, say, in December, and uh, you didn't earn more than $7,500 in that calendar year, then this could be a tax problem for you. So always be sure and check with your tax professional about details like that, affordability, et cetera. So especially if you're on the border of, uh, you know, should I get car X or car Y because it has the full tax credit versus uh, not the full tax credit, definitely keep something like that in mind. Um, so with that out of the way, let's dive into a few random topics here. So our first topic uh, was hydrogen. We've had a lot of talk about uh, hydrogen and EVs and all that kind of stuff. And why did I pick a hydrogen car? Um, I thought we were fairly clear on that one, but maybe I need to talk about it a little, little bit more detail here. Um, and that tax credit definitely factors into this discussion. So um, remember that uh, the tax credit, the $7,500 tax credit, A, applies by manufacturer. So once a manufacturer has reached 200,000 vehicles that qualify for the tax credit sold, then they start sunsetting the tax credit. That's why Tesla no longer qualifies for the full $7,500 credit on each vehicle that they sell. Uh, and a as a matter of fact, uh, I believe it's after July 1st uh, is what it was, that tax credit is now one fourth of what it was before. So the way the sunsetting works is it steps down quarter by quarter by quarter, it gets cut in half, then it gets cut in half again, and then it disappears. So uh, right about now, there's under $2,000 worth of credit available on every new Tesla. But if you were to go out and buy a new Nissan, that's going to have a $2,000 tax, or uh, $7,000, sorry, uh, dollar tax credit still on it, the full one, because they have not reached $200,000 in sales yet. Uh, at the moment, the only two companies that have reached that number are Tesla and General Motors was just right nipping on their heels. That's because Te General Motors started first with the, uh, the Volt. Uh, it qualified for the fel full federal tax credit because it applies to plug-in hybrid vehicles as well as EVs, as well as hydrogen vehicles, something a lot of people don't realize. And there are still credits available that may apply to compressed natural gas vehicles as well, although nobody sells them new at this point anymore. Um, so one of the big reasons there for the Nexo or any hydrogen vehicle in California is it qualifies for the full $7,500 tax credit. Uh, the next thing to know is if you lease your EV or your green car, whatever that may be, then you do not get the tax credit. The leasing company gets the tax credit um, and the leasing company does not get the full credit. This is an important thing to know. So, um, pardon me here. My laptop has suddenly decided it wants to restart itself. Um, so if you lease a car, the leasing company gets the tax credit of, of portion of it, and then they will use that to reduce the cost of your lease. So your lease payments get reduced as a result of that credit. Um, then if there is an applicable state credit, then you can apply for that in your own right. Uh, Colorado is the most generous at the moment. So if you're an EV lover in Colorado, you're going to get a really great deal on your EV there. Um, and uh, if you are in California, for instance, the EV credit ends up being a little bit lower. Uh, Oh, no, no, that's okay. My, I, I told it to restart tomorrow. Sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> um, so that's how the tax credit works there. Um, the next thing to know is hydrogen vehicles are very heavily subsidized. So this is purely a dollars and cents thing. So 
Uh, arguably, if you're a, a a person that's after the greenest vehicle out there and you can source your power from, from solar panels or wind or whatever the greenest source you have available, that's probably going to be the greenest thing you can drive right now. Um, hydrogen cars, uh, the hydrogen is sourced about 33%, 40% or so from renewable resources, and that is increasing over time. Uh, that's about average for electricity in California, uh, but overall they're not quite as efficient. Um, the real fact of the matter though is that all the fuel is included in the price of the lease. So dollars and cents wise, the Hyundai Nexo is less expensive to operate than the Soul EV that it replaced, uh, than the Kona EV that we were considering, uh, than the Leaf Plus, which we weren't honestly considering but was on our list. Um, and it was actually less expensive to operate as well versus a Model 3 uh, in our situation. So that's that's the long and the short of it there. Um, but I have to say that again that if the Model Y existed, then that probably would have been at the top of my shopping list. Um, so there we go. That's how that all works. Let's dive on into the next question here. Uh, let's see, Genesis G70 or Volvo S60? Ooh, that is a tough question. I love the value proposition of the G70, but I like the interior of the S60 a little bit more. I also think the exterior of the S60 is a little bit prettier. Um, Genesis G70 definitely is the better handler. Uh, it has that solid rear wheel drive dynamic, which you don't get in the S60. Um, the Genesis is probably also going to be more reliable in the long run, uh, especially if you plan on keeping your car for eight or 10 years, something along those lines, the Genesis is going to be less problematic and uh, probably less expensive to repair as well. The Volvo S60 may be easier to get your hands on because there still are, are a shortage of Genesis dealers in America. Uh, let's see here. When will we be reviewing the Lincoln Aviator? We don't know yet. Uh, fortunately, we were invited to the Explorer launch, so I'm keeping my fingers crossed that we'll get invited to the Aviator event but I don't have any details on that just yet. So Lincoln and Ford definitely have different lists of who they want there. And I don't know if I'm on their list, to be honest. So we'll see. Uh, if I had a $10,000 budget, would you buy a 2011 G70 or 2014 328i? Um, I'd probably buy the 328i. That would be my thought there. Let's see here. Uh, someone else is asking here, why don't the Hellcat products compete with M5, et cetera? Um, it's sort of the hammer versus whatever pick your pick the correct tool here so you know you uh you're looking to drill a hole in a wall and you say well you know if i need this quarter inch hole right back here to hang the shelf on then i should probably get a drill and drill the right hole and use the right wall anchor etc or you could just grab a hammer and stab it in the wall and then hang your picture on the hammer um that's sort of the difference between the two the hellcat vehicles are very very fast but they don't handle they handle well, but they don't handle as well as they go fast, if that makes sense. So if you were to draw a chart and you were to say, you know, uh, acceleration is nine out of 10 points uh, and handling is nine out of 10 points. Well, the Hellcat, maybe it's 11 out of 10 points, something like that, absolutely crazy, but handling is, you know, seven or eight out of 10 points. So they just don't handle like an M5 or an E63S or something along those lines. It's just, it's a very different flavor of vehicle. Uh, they also don't have the interior trappings that can compete in the luxury segment, even though their price tag is is similar there. Uh, Chris, yes, we did get rid of our soul already. It went back to the dealer. It was a lease, so it, it has returned to the motherland. Um, what do we think of the Buick Envision? That is an interesting question, Stephen. Um, for some reason, Buick has never sent us an Envision. I have asked for an Envision for years, and they have never sought fit to bring one up here. And at this point, I'm almost uh, uh, trying not to have a conspiracy theory around this, saying, well, why don't they want me to have an Envision? Um, the odd thing about the Envision, just based on other Buicks that we've driven, We've driven all of the others, just the Envision somehow is remaining, mind you. Um, and its pricing structure, I think there are better deals out there unless you get a really smashing deal on the Envision. Um, I like the overall Buick design theme, and I like the thought of a entry-level luxury brand being uh, value-oriented and um, more premium than something like a Chevy, but less expensive than something like a Cadillac. The trouble I have with GM's pricing scheme right now, and this afflicts both Cadillac and Buick really, is that the price tags are awfully high. Um, they're depending so much on dealer discounts really to move the products that it makes real comparisons difficult. So <coughs> here in Alex and Auto's 
we can't go by dealer discounts since they're always changing. Uh, we have to go by MSRP. And by the MSRP, the Envision is pricey. Uh, and I think that the Acura RDX would be a better buy uh, over the Envision. Um, I also have to say, even if you got a relatively good deal on an Envision, I would probably lean towards the RDX as well. The RDX is fun. Uh, it's fresher. It's newer. Um, and I, I think I like the overall experience, the overall look a little bit better in the Acura. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Honda CRV hybrids. Any news about it in America? No, not yet. It does exist, obviously, in other world markets, but Honda really won't say if and when it's coming to America. Uh, I would say that we should know soon. However, if it's going to come in 2020, uh, most likely if the CRV hybrid is coming to America, again, still an if, but if it's coming to America, we'll probably know around November of this year. Uh, Honda tends to announce their green products at the Los Angeles Auto Show. That's happening in November. We'll probably know about it a little bit before that, so it's probably going to be around in that same time. Let's see here. So uh, Taylor is asking about carbon buildup in turbocharged engines. What can owners do to mitigate this problem? So the, the, the big question here around carbon buildup is not necessarily turbocharged engines, but turbocharged direct injection engines or just regular direct injection engines. Uh, we've spoken on this a number of times before. There's there's a lot of talk about carbon buildup and is it a problem? Is it not a problem? Um, a lot of this is stoked by, um, shall we say, uh, people who are, are old school in their thought processes online. They don't like new things. Um, I have to say, I don't have a problem uh, personally getting a direct injection engine. Um, at the moment, come to think of it, I don't own one, uh, but there's no particular reason that I don't have one. If, if, if it had been available in whatever vehicle we were interested in, I wouldn't have had a second thought about, about owning a direct injection engine. Um, the, the reason that there's carbon buildup is because of the way that engines work. So if I grab my nifty little pad here, we can show you. So in an engine, we have a cylinder wall here. We have the piston here in the middle, crankshaft, you know, down there at the bottom. Um, and the piston sliding the in and out of the cylinder here, it's not a perfect fit. So we have rings that are our little metal bands that go around the piston right like that. And that's what keeps the piston sealed, for lack of a better word, in the cylinder. Um, and the problem is everything leaks. Nothing is perfect. So there's a thin coating of oil on the side here. Uh, as things go by that helps lubricate it all. But anytime you have an explosion going on here and fuel going on, you're going to get something slipping past the rings. We call this blow by. So you have a little bit of soot, a little bit of com combustion products, a little bit of gasoline, perhaps even depending on exactly what's going on, all that's going down here into the oil that's sitting down there at the bottom in the sump of the engine. But some of this is going to stay atomized. Now for emissions regulations, uh, manufacturers are no longer allowed to just sort of let whatever this is, this unburnt whatever, they're not allowed that, uh, they're not allowed to have that go back to the atmosphere. So what they do is, is called uh, exhaust gas recirculation or EGR. So what they'll do is they'll have a little tube and it comes out from there and it goes right into the air intake. So that's the air, call that the air intake right there. So this is the EGR loop. And so it is effectively sucking these exhaust gases from the crankcase into there. Um, I'm sorry, PCV, my brain is not working. Positive crankcase ventilation, EGR is something entirely different. We'll cross that out right there. My bad, um, PCV. So my acronyms are not working in my head today. Positive crankcase ventilation. So sucking, sucking gases out of the crankcase area here, throwing them into the air intake. This has unburnt hydrocarbons. This has uh, oil mist. This has whatever, whatever the heck is going on there. And that can theoretically build up on the intake valve. So we have the intake valve here. It's kind of sort of, sort of kind of shaped like that. Um, this stuff can end up hanging out there on the intake valve. And then it can cause a seating problem because the intake valve seats in this little area here. So when it goes back up, it needs to make a seal on these little angled sections right here. And if there's too much carbon buildup, it can affect this seal right here. Or theoretically, if there's a, a lot of carbon buildup, then it could cause little stalactites that could reduce engine performance, it could reduce uh, intake, etc. Now, how much is built up depends on a huge variety of factors. That's just too impossible to say this is good or this is bad. Because if you have very little blow by, you're not going to have a lot of buildup over here. Um, if you have some sort of filtration system, 
uh, effective filtration system in this PCV loop, then you're not going to get as much buildup because it's going to be catching the oil. It's going to be catching whatever mists come through. Um, if you have valves with a different coating on them, they could prevent the buildup of this material. Uh, if you have a combustion cycle that is very complete, then you'll get less buildup, etc. Um, you'll also get less buildup in certain stratified injection engines because there's simply going to be less blow-by. Um, so it's it's difficult to say yes or no. Now, we, we do know that there are certain engine designs that are very prone to build up just by their very nature. Uh, there was uh, one, especially one Volkswagen engine design that caused this whole fervor uh, over uh, build up on the intake valves. Um, and then there was one General Motors engine design that had some initial teething problems. But aside from that, we really haven't had much of a problem with carbon buildup. Um, when you take a look at uh, Hyundai and Kia engines, um, General Motors engines, Ford is, has invested massive amounts of money on direct injection engines. Um, you take a look at those engine designs, especially the General Motors 3.6, um, the Hyundai Kia direct injection line of engines, generally the 2.4, um, and the, the more modern EcoBoost series of engines, uh, especially the, the, the longer living ones in Ford's lineup. Uh, they have not shown any true carbon buildup problems over 100,000 miles, etc. Now, there's also been a, a sideways conspiracy theory going on here that um, the the solution to this uh, is what Toyota has devised with D4S, and that that is that they use direct injection where they're injecting directly into this area of the cylinder above the piston, and they're also using multi-port injection where they're injecting right here just above, so there's a little injector right here, just above the intake valve. And this spraying action of spraying fuel in here cleans the intake valve. And there's this conspiracy theory running around that, oh, Toyota knew about this problem and that's why they use D4S to, to prevent the buildup of carbon. The reality is that Toyota has been very upfront about why D4S exists. D4S exists because there are um, combustion cycle realities where multi-port fuel injection is either A, more efficient, or B, most importantly, better for emissions. So emissions regulations are driving a lot of the, the combined systems that we are seeing on the market. And um, other manufacturers like, uh, the, uh, like Ford and, uh, as I recall, FCA, um, have said that their newer engine designs are likely the future, not, not coming up this year, future engine designs are likely going to have both direct injection and multi-port injection, not because of carbon buildup, but because of emissions compliance. Um, particulate emissions especially are difficult to, uh, to achieve compliance for in certain RPM and load cycles if you're doing direct injection only. So to uh, help meet those legislative requirements, that's why they're moving to that particular technology. So with that out of the way, I think we we'll beat that on the head. Let's move on to the next item here. Uh, what in something's asking about a 2020 Sentra here. So uh, oops, let's dive back there into the list again. YouTube has a pretty terrible chat thing here. Uh, let's see here. Someone's asking about a 2020 refresh for the Honda Ridgeline. No news uh, there yet, although Honda has said that the Ridgeline, the Pilot, and the Passport are theoretically going to be a little bit more differentiated whenever they do come up for a refresh. But you can bet that the Pilot is going to be first since it's the oldest in that group. Uh, see, someone's asking more on the 2020 Outback. Uh, we will be driving that on Monday, actually. So my editor and I are going up to Fort Bragg, California. We'll be driving it there. And as I recall, uh, you'll be able to see that review on the 19th of July. That's when that will be available. What's the word on the 2020 Sentra? And will there be a turbo version? There is a turbo version right now. It's the Sentra SR Turbo. So you can get that now. Uh, no word on any other Sentra refreshes. The Versa, however, is coming soon. Don't expect any changes to the Sentra uh, since it's not terribly old uh, as far as that goes. Uh, let's see here. Have you got any further information on new Kia SUV, the Stelos? Uh, no, nope, not any more than anybody else has seen. So hopefully we'll be seeing more of that soon. Thoughts on the leaked MDX and TLX photos? The MDX looked pretty much the same. The TLX I thought was interesting, but I'll, I'll believe it more when we see it. Um, I had hoped that the TLX would go a little further outside the, the, the norm here, but we haven't really seen that. Uh, let's see here. Um, I can't wait to see the next generation Sorento and Optima. Uh, I'm interested to see how the Sorento is going to change this next uh, generation. Is it going to stay Highlander-esque uh, or not? Um, the Optima, that's a tough segment. I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't see a new 
Hey everybody, sorry for the live stream issues that we just had there. Hopefully we are now back on. Uh, we had a, a dead battery in our Mevo. That's embarrassing. Uh, I will uh, pass that along to our editor there. So let's hopefully try and catch back up where we left off. I don't remember exactly where that was, but we'll give this a whirl here. Uh, so let's see here. Um, any plans to renew the Elantra GT N line? I certainly hope so, but I don't know when we'll be able to get our hands on that. Hopefully sometime soon. Let's see here. Someone's trying to decide between the Explorer ST and the Durango RT. Which do you think will be more reliable? Ooh, that's a tricky one. Um, I would say if you're looking at keeping the vehicle really long term, then something like the Durango RT with the 5.7 liter V8 is probably going to be more reliable in the long run. Uh, the Durango, when you take a look at, at reliability metrics for that one, we know more about the Durango since it's been around for so long. So there's a lot more um, available data about that. Uh, it hasn't performed too, too badly in its segment overall. <clears throat> Most of the issues have been complaints about electronic systems. Um, remember that a lot of the reliability metrics out there also include ease of use, and sometimes that can hurt uh, systems like Uconnect. Um, the Explorer ST, I expect it to be probably a little bit less reliable than the current generation Explorer, but probably not too far off. The engine is a known quantity, so is the 10-speed automatic transmission. Um, so some of the integration in that vehicle may be, may be more of a problem. Um, but that's kind of an open-ended question. I, I would say probably long-term, the, the Durango would probably be a little bit more um, more reliable. Uh, they're kind of different vehicles. The Durango is definitely more towing focused, more uh, attempting to replace a body on frame SUV in something that's more crossover shaped, for lack of a better word. It is a bit bigger on the outside. Uh, the Explorer ST is a little bit tighter, a little bit more fun, um, but not quite as smooth in terms of transmission refinement, and it can't tow as much. So those are the major differences there. Uh, let's see here. Uh, any news about a new plug-in from hybrid from Toyota or Honda? I've had a number of questions about this. Um, no no news from Toyota on plug-in hybrids and nothing really rumored. So remember that when it comes to EVs and plug-ins, Toyota is very bearish on, on those vehicles, uh, primarily because they don't need them at the moment. So Toyota does not seem to like products that are overtly unprofitable, for the lack of a better word. And <clears throat> there are very few EVs that are intrinsically profitable in the world at the moment. Rumor mill has it that the Leaf is most likely profitable at this point in time, but none of the current Tesla models are overtly profitable. Once you exclude um, <clears throat> the EV credits that they sell, <clears throat> and once you exclude um, things like the the deals that have struck with FCA to share their EV, EV uh, sales in uh, Europe, so at the moment, Toyota doesn't need any EV credits for compliance because they have enough hybrids on sale in America, and they don't need the bump for their cafe numbers because they don't sell very large numbers of, of heavy trucks. Um, so I don't think that we're going to see though, uh, those vehicles until either the costs come down a little bit or we see uh, a sales mix change in Toyota uh, or legislative changes, to be perfectly honest there. Uh, let's move along here. Let's see here. Uh, what do we think of the Camry Hybrid? It's the only option we get in Europe. I like the Camry Hybrid. I think it's a good step above the base engine that we get here in America. And it's also a no compromises hybrid. It's a good deal. We get better performance than the regular engine. We get decent handling. Uh, and there's really no loss in overall practicality. So let's see here. More on the 2020 Outback. Uh, again, we'll know that uh, next week. And then stay tuned for that review coming up probably July 19th, I believe it is, when that will be uh, available here. Uh, someone's looking for either a Passport and Edge or a Telluride retired with no kids. Hmm. Uh, I guess I would ask why a Telluride? The Telluride is awfully big. Um, in that group, I would say the Santa Fe is the, the more appropriate competitor. Um, I like the Edge, I think, overall a little bit more than the Passport. The Passport's interior, for some reason, bothers me um, a surprising amount. And a lot of other people I've talked to aren't bothered at all by the Passport's interior. But maybe it's because we've seen it uh, since 2016 uh, in the pilot that it just doesn't seem as fresh as some of the alternatives. And I think that even though the Edge's interior is just about as old, if not older, than the Pilot's, um, it, it feels fresher. I think it's aged better. 
Um, I do like the Telluride's interior, but it is a little on the big side. It's a good value, though. Um, I would say the Santa Fe is a good option there. Uh, the new 2020 Outback is going to be a good option in that segment. Um, and um, that's probably it. And I'd probably go with those options. Um, or I would say at that size point, if you're looking for something that's premium, you might want to look at something in the next category up, something uh, along the lines of a, uh, a European compact crossover. This is going to be in a similar price point. Uh, so there are definitely a lot of options for you there. Let's see here. Uh, Rod is asking for an EV with enough room for one car seat and cargo space to support all the rest of the baby gear. What's the best bet, new or used? Um, an EV with room for one car seat. Uh, the Nero from Kia is probably going to be your best bet outside of a Tesla Model 3. Uh, the Model 3 has a, a surprising amount of room, really, in the back seat for especially a rear-facing child seat. Um, the cargo area, it's not an SUV, it's not a crossover thing, so the cargo areas may not be as convenient as something like the Nero, and depending on your exact location, uh, you may not be able to get the Nero, mind you. Um, so I would say uh, for that, it would be my top picks would be the Nero and, and probably the Model 3 as well. Let's see here. I uh, don't know if I should buy the Chrysler Pacifica or the Grand Caravan. I would Pacifica if I was shopping between those two and you don't mind the price increase. The Pacifica is definitely newer, fresher, a lot more premium, etc. And I would definitely look at the plug-in Pacifica too. Uh, let's see here. Mitsubishi Outlander, Dodge Journey, but the Mitsubishi is safer. Why is this? Uh, the Outlander and Journey don't really share that much is the main reason for that. When you take a look at the, the um, let's see here. I have a note on this somewhere. The Dodge Journey and the um, doesn't share too much with a lot of the other vehicles here. It uh, oh yeah, it's, they have the Chrysler JC. So the the JC platform there shared a little bit with um, very old Mitsubishi's actually. So that's the primary reason there is you know the, the the small relationship that they had is very old. Remember that when we're talking about platform sharing. Um, actual parts sharing tends to be very low the further off you get from the original relation. So theoretically, the Range Rover Evoque that we have right in this week in for review um, is related to the Volvo XC60 from the last generation, the one that was released in 2013, 2014, something around there. Um, it's based on theoretically the Ford EUCD platform, but that doesn't mean it shares any parts at this point. If you were to pry open the door panels on the Range Rover Evoque um, or take a look under the hood, <clears throat> even though it's on the platform, quote unquote, there's really gonna be nothing that is directly shared. Um, platform sharing for some companies means stick a new badge on it. But for most modern vehicles, platform sharing ends up being um, a sharing of, of suspension designs, crash structure designs, um, general mounting points, that sort of thing, um, or, or even more basic uh, stamping shapes and stamping sizes that can be adapted to a production line. Um, and so that's why they're going to crash differently is because there's really not that much that's shared there. So moving along here... Um, is it worth buying a $30,000 car in cash or just lease instead, considering for the long term? Long, long term, if you're going to buy your car and you want to keep it for 10 years, 15 years, buying is generally going to be the better option unless you are in a very stable financial situation and the lease is a smashing deal. Um, if the lease is a really great deal, then you might want to lease and then buy your lease out at the end, depending on the cost of money and the lease deal going on. So number of vehicles out there are like this. So for instance, uh, the Dodge Durango that we got, we ended up leasing it for two reasons. The first one was I really kind of wanted the new Ford Explorer. Initially, I thought that would be a great alternative to my Durango. Unfortunately, it can't tow like the Durango can tow. So that's been crossed off the list. Um, the other reason was when you add up the total of the lease payments, plus the residual on the lease to buy it out at the end of the lease, that was less then paying cash on the Durango because of the lease deal that was going on at the moment. So in that particular situation, leasing and then buying is the better alternative for that particular vehicle. But generally speaking, buying is going to be it. 
Uh, let's see here. Do we know when the XC40 plug-in hybrid will be available? No news out of Sweden on that one. Uh, we have been told, though, that it will be after the Polestar 2. So the Polestar is going to be their first vehicle. Uh, then it's going to be something along the lines of the XC40. But Volvo has now been pretty cagey on whether it will be exactly the XC40 or something along the lines of the XC40. Uh, don't know when that will be, but my guess is that we will start seeing it maybe announced in Europe next year. Not available for sale necessarily, but announced. And then it will probably be a full year after it's announced in Europe that we'll actually see it available for sale in the United States. Let's see here. Naveen's asking if towing wasn't here, would we have still gotten the Durango? If not, what would you have bought instead? Um, yeah, that's pretty easy to say. If towing wasn't a not wasn't a thing uh, for us, then no, I don't think we would have bought the Durango. What would we have bought instead? Mm, I don't know. I probably would have bought something along the lines of maybe I don't know, randomly thinking out loud here, maybe a Volvo S ninety. Uh, I like the S ninety. Um, I like the Volvo S sixty and V sixty wagons. Maybe something along those lines. Probably wouldn't have been a crossover. I don't think. Um, possibly a sedan, maybe a station wagon, uh, something along those lines. Anyway, any new guesses on the 2020 Ridgeline refresh? I think we covered that already. When will the U.S. get the next generation G80? Uh, you can bet that the U.S. will be either the launch market or the second market for the G80 whenever we do get that. Should we buy the Accord 2.0T or the 1.5T? I really like the 2.0T. So if you're debating and you think you like the price tag on the 2.0T, I would definitely go with that one. Someone's looking for a PHEV with at least a 200 mile range. What do you recommend? Well, all plug-in hybrids are going to have a 200 mile range overall, but remember that none, no plug-in hybrid is going to have an electric range of 200 miles. So you're going to be going the first 40 miles, 50 miles on electricity. And then after that, you're going to be looking at, at gasoline propulsion. Um, I would say for leases, obviously the deal is the most important. So I would just shop around and see which plug-in hybrid has the le the best deal on it. Um, and then also you're going to need to decide what kind of plug-in hybrid you want. There's sort of a spectrum here. We have plug-in hybrid vehicles that are EV first, plug-in next. So something along the lines of a uh, BMW i3 with the range extender. It's an EV with a backup plan, it's still technically a plug-in hybrid. Um, and then we have vehicles like the Ionic or the Nero plug-in hybrid, which are on the opposite side of the scale. They have a relatively small electric motor and they are going to provide the ability for electric only range, but it's under limited situations. So uh, you are too aggressive on the throttle, it's gonna turn on the gasoline engine. If you wanna heat the cabin, it's gonna turn on the gasoline engine. Logic for that one, according to Kia and Hyundai was, why put the extra weight for an electric heater in there when we've got a gasoline engine that can run and propel the vehicle and use its waste energy to heat the cabin. So in, in that instance, if you're, for instance, uh, in the winter in those vehicles, you've charged it, you turn it on in the morning, gasoline engine turns on, it's gonna provide some motive power, but it's also gonna be heating the cabin. And then at some point in time when the cabin is warm, it will then start using more electricity. It's still gonna use both sources, but it's not gonna be that pure EV thing that you're interested in. So uh, it depends on what you're looking for. The, the Volt, which has theoretically been discontinued, really straddles the fence between those two lines. Um, and I think that the Clarity is a really great option overall. If I were specifically looking for plug-in hybrid vehicle at this moment, it would probably be the Clarity. That's probably what I would get. Um, and uh, it is controversial looking. It has those rear fender skirts. But the best part about the Clarity and the fender skirts for buying one is that when you're on the inside, you can't see them. Uh, when will we review the 2020 Highlander? We are told that that will probably be at the end of this calendar year. So it's probably going to be November or December of 2019. I'm not sure why it's taken so long there. Um, I'm a little bit surprised that, that Toyota announced it so long ago and then they're taking so long to really do the launch event. But we were told that that was the plan uh, months and months and months ago that, you know, at its very launch uh, back east in that auto show. Um, that it would be a very long, long time until we drove it. So who knows why? Uh, let's see here. Nero Kona available in Michigan within next year? Probably not. Uh, remember that there's a worldwide, A, there's a worldwide battery shortage, and B, the main reason the Kona and Nero exist is to qualify for uh, California's emissions regulations. So this is also the reason that we see it in the 10 other states that it's available in right now, is that according to California's emissions mandate, you cannot just 
qualify for California emissions compliance by just selling in California, you also have to sell in the states that follow California's emissions regulations. Michigan does not, therefore they're not sold in Michigan. Um, however, the Nero is being sold in two states that are not part of that deal. Um, and we'll see if that expands to more states in the future. But at the moment, they've both been pretty cagey on that. And so I don't expect anything within a calendar year. Let's put it that way. If you're wanting an EV outside uh, the main states, then you're looking at Tesla. Michigan's a problem for Tesla, however, because there aren't any, uh, uh, the way the laws work in Michigan, it's a little bit difficult to get a Tesla there. Um, or the uh, the Nissan EVs and the General Motors EVs. The Ford and Volkswagen EVs, it looks like they will be sold na nationally too. We'll know a little bit more when those get here. Uh, let's see, do we think a 2017, 2019 Explorer is still a good buy? Looking for less than $30,000. If you get a really good deal on the Explorer, this is definitely the time to do it. Um, outgoing models always sell at a discount. So with the new, new Explorer coming on the scene, you're gonna see some pretty good discounts on the previous generation model. When's the next refresh of the Sorento? That's probably going to be at least two years off. Um, 2016 was the last big, big deal for the Sorento. And then we got a little bit of a refresh for 2019. So it's probably going to be 2021-ish until we see something there. Let's see here. Do we think it's fair to compare handling in a Crest 300S to a Lexus GS F Sport? Uh, I would say yes. That probably is okay-ish. But remember that the Chrysler 300 is much bigger than the GS. So the Chrysler 300 has been stretched um, dimensionally to almost S-class kind of size. So it may have started its life as an E-class, but it certainly didn't end its life uh, in the E-class size category. Uh, let's see here. Any updates on the Genesis GV90 release date? Supposedly, we will be seeing a Genesis crossover at the LA Auto Show. So stay tuned for that one. Um, let's see here. If we get more normal prices for pickups, nope, pickups are probably going to remain expensive because they are hot sellers. So um, they are definitely pricey. And also um, remember that pickups, American pickups, I'm saying here because that's the bulk of the pickup segment, um, they tend to sell at discounts off MSRP. So it's not necessarily unusual to see an ad saying $10,000 off a Ram 1500 or a Chevy Silverado or a Ford F-150. Um, and so you do have to have those higher price tags to have those big sales deals. Um, I used to work for a company who joked every now and then that said that, you know, we're never going to sell a full priced service because they'd been selling with advertisements on the radio for 30% off, 40% off, 50% off um, for so long that how do you ever go back to selling for full price? Um, pickup trucks end up in that category really too. Let's see here. Um, why do journalists have to see a vehicle in person before they can determine if they like the exterior design or not? Why are photographs not good enough? I would say <coughs> that that's because photographs don't always work well with all designs. Sometimes I've seen a design where I thought, wow, I really don't like that. Um, and then I see it in person. I think, okay, you know, maybe I can handle that. Um, or some things like I didn't think that the Mazda 3 hatchback was terribly bad looking in photos. And then I got it in person and I thought that's a really strange looking rear end. Um, really not a fan of the rear end design in the Mazda 3 hatch. Um, but I wasn't sure about it in photos. I thought, well, you know, maybe I could live with that. Um, and I think, I think I can't in the end. So if that makes sense, sometimes, sometimes things don't look right in real world lighting. So the, the photo that you will see printed in the glossy magazine is the best angle and the best shot you could possibly get with the car. You know, maybe things have been airbrushed, who knows. Um, but when you really get the car in person, you'll see how the angles look in real light. Um, sometimes it's, for me also, it, it's how easy is it to clean? Um, because we generally do dust or, or, or wash the cars before we film them. And some car designs just really drive me nutty. They may seem like a good idea initially, but when you get them home, they're, they're a pain in the butt to clean. Um, let's see here. Is the Mazda 6 reliable? In general terms, I would say yes, but it is generally speaking also less reliable than uh, the Camry, the Accord, the Sonata, and Optima. Generally speaking in that order. Uh, let's see here. <clears throat> without uh, without Opal, someone is worried for Buick. Uh, I have to say that I am a little sad about that that lack of a tie-up there. So for those that don't know, um, most of mo most of Buick's modern lineup is either made from Chinese market Buicks or European Opals with a Buick logo on it. 
And I always thought that that was a relatively rational tie-up for Buick because you get the European driving dynamics and some designs that we don't necessarily see in the US. Um, but then you have something for Buick to sell that's a little bit different than a Chevy or a Cadillac or something along those lines. Um, and uh, yeah, we don't know where that's going to lead for Buick. Um, their crossover lineup is probably going to be shifting uh, towards Chinese-centric designs, uh, which makes a lot of sense. A lot of people don't don't uh, don't understand it or don't like that thought process, but it really does make a lot of sense. Generally speaking, the Chinese market tends to like uh, larger, more softly sprung vehicles than Europe, and that makes a lot of sense for America. That's why, for instance, we get the Buick Envision. It's why we get the Volvo S90 that is tied with the Chinese market, not the European market. We get the bigger one, basically. Um, and we're probably going to be seeing more of that alignment as the world realities for car design shift. Um, the U.S. is no longer the world's largest car market. That's that's a, a, a fundamental shift, really, in vehicle design. Um, for decades and decades and decades, uh, probably a century, really, uh, America has led worldwide car design and car consumption. So, you know, if you're thinking of designing a new car and you want it to have the biggest worldwide appeal, you you consider how it's going to sell in America first. Then you consider how can we adapt this to Europe. Um, then we decide maybe we can make a left a right hand drive one for England and for Australia and Japan. Um, that's sort of how that thought process works. And it's really obvious when you take a look at, at how a lot of European cars are built. So if we take a look at European luxury cars, for instance, and their big engines uh, and the big footprints, um, they're, they're designed for us. They're not necessarily designed directly for Europe. Um, Mercedes GLS, BMW X5, BMW X7, Mercedes GLE, the, especially the crossovers, these are designed for American tastes. Um, but now we're seeing that China is a bigger car market. So we're seeing cars that are being designed for China first, and then maybe we'll get a copy. So Volvo S90 designed for China first, we're getting a copy. That's why Volvo doesn't have any big engines anymore, because they're not necessary in Europe or in China. And America is Volvo's third largest market at the moment. Um, and that's also why we're seeing things like the Volkswagen uh, Atlas two row crossover is designed and released in China as the Terramont. Uh, and then we might get it in America as the Atlas cross. So we are seeing this fundamental shift um, in the way that that vehicles are designed around. Um, and I think that's probably going to go for for Buick as well. So moving along here, let's see here. Major updates on the next generation Optima and Mazda six. The Mazda six should be all new when it's all new. We don't really know. But it, logically, it's going to come probably after the CX-5 gets a refresh. So I would say we're going to see the CX-5 first, then maybe the Mazda 6. Remember, the CX-5 is the more popular vehicle overall. Optima, <coughs> I'm going to go ahead and guess that we won't see a truly next generation Optima until probably 2025 would be my guess around there. Let's see here. Someone's asking, Telluride driving dynamics, how do they compare to the Ascent and Highlander? Does it drive like a bigger vehicle or is it closer to those vehicles? Uh, first up, remember the Telluride is huge on the inside, but it's not huge on the outside. So in terms of, of overall size, it's not that far off the Subaru Ascent um, and it's a little bit smaller than the Mazda CX-9. Overall driving dynamics are good in the segment. I would say the CX-9 has an overall better feel to it. Um, the Ford Explorer definitely handles better and is more sporty, but versus the Ascent and the Highlander, I like the way the Telluride handles better than either of those, those options. I also like, I think, the way the Telluride handles better than the Honda Pilot overall. The Pilot has a torque vectoring axle, and so it ends up being a vehicle full of highs and lows. Um, the Telluride handles better than it in neutral handling situations, but the Pilot is definitely a better handling vehicle power on in corners because of that torque vectoring axle. But that doesn't, it doesn't even the picture out enough for me, I think, to choose the pilot over the Telluride for handling. Let's put it that way. Uh, moving on here. Uh, how many staff do we have for our channel? Um, I have my full-time editor here who's Alex. She can come over and wave. Wave. <laughs> oh, that was, that was, that was, that was all we got was just the little hand down there. Okay. So Alex is here. She is our videographer and our full-time editor. So she does... 90, 95% of the editing here at Alex and Autos. And then I have two part-time videographers that do travel and whatever is necessary. 
Um, and they're primarily working on a different side of the business. So in this office here where I am, um, we have two different businesses going on, the Alex and Otto side, uh, also the theoretically the, the side that's supposed to be working on some other video channels that have really not gotten off the ground. And then there's a materials engineering company on that side of the wall over there. Um, and uh, I handle the organization, um, accounting, um, sort of general uh, employee, dealing with employees, benefits, managing employees, that sort of thing. Um, and I'm co-owner of that one. So, you know, everything is jammed here into the same same company. So it's it's tricky. Everybody does what they're told and there are seven of us total. Um, and I do what I'm told, that's all I know. So moving along here, is there a first look or walk around video for the Model Y? No, because the Model Y does not exist yet. So we don't really know what it's gonna look like exactly. Um, all, the, all the things that they've shown is basically a bloated Model 3. Um, nobody's really seen a real one and it's definitely some time uh, from now that it's going to be released. So uh, we won't know too much until next year it's looking like for that one. Someone's looking for a family friendly vehicle, 25k or less, it's efficient on fuel, debating Kia Sorento versus RAV4 Hybrid. I would say the RAV4 Hybrid is probably going to be where you might want to go. If you're shopping used, then that, that changes that a little bit. Then I would say get whatever might be a, a better, better buy. Um, the RAV4 Hybrid is definitely going to be giving you the better fuel economy, the lower operational costs. Um, but I see on your list here, you're saying uh, that you're looking at something like a Kia Sorento. That's probably going to depreciate faster than the RAV4. So that may be your better buy. Let's see here. CX-5 Signature or Santa Fe Unlimited Ultimate. That's a tricky one. I like the CX-5 Signature. I think it is a lot prettier. Uh, the Santa Fe Ultimate is comfier and bigger. So if you want the room, I would Santa Fe. If you didn't need the room, I would probably CX-5 Signature. I really like the CX-5's look and I like the turbo uh, in the current one. So if it were me, I would probably CX-5. Uh, but I would say that if you have child seats or a lot of folks in the back, and you want to carry a lot of cargo, you're probably going to want to look at the Santa Fe. But if it were me, I would probably CX-5. Uh, moving along here, thoughts on the Rivian SUV. Do you think it will compete against the Model X? The Rivian SUV is totally different than the Model X. Um, the Model X really is a minivan. Let's put it that way. Um, I know that Tesla's calling it a SUV, but when you look at the ground clearance figures, the fact that it's not supposed to go off road, um, <clears throat> the way that it's constructed, etc., the Model X really is the Tesla minivan. It's the Model S minivan. Um, the Rivian SUV is going to be more the EV version of the first generation Bronco, maybe much more ground clearance, more off-road focused, um, more upright, less efficient in terms of overall pra uh, packaging, less practical, really, to be perfectly honest. Um, but much more focused on that off-road mission, uh, than the Model X. Um, so which, which is the better one? We don't know yet because we haven't seen the Rivian exactly. Um, they're telling us that it will be basically what we've seen, but not exactly. So we'll have to stay tuned and see what that really looks like in person. Uh, I do like the look of the Rivian overall better. I like the boxier profile, etc. cetera. Um, but you can bet that the Rivian is going to be less efficient. Um, it's probably going to take longer to charge. Um, it may not have all the bells and whistles that we see on the Model X, especially if you're looking for the more, uh, the more modern semi-autonomous features. It's probably going to be more advanced than the Model X. Um, but then again, the Model X is not going to be fresh or new because Tesla has recently said no refresh on schedule for Model S or X. So if you want new, that you're probably going to want Rivian. Uh, if you want something that's been around for a while, then Model X. Uh, I will say that although I've said before that the Tesla fit and finish doesn't bother me too much, that mainly applies to the Model 3 and the Model S. On the Model X, it bugs me a lot because the way the door handles are aligned, front door handle and side door handle, um, I have never seen a Model X where those door handles met properly. And that does bug me, just that particular thing on that particular car. Um, most panel gaps don't bug me, but that handle does. Let's see here. Uh, how do you think, how likely do you think it is that the Mo that Mazda will release a turbo version of the Model 3? Not too likely. Let's put it that way. Uh, Telluride Palisade projected reliability high. So expect, uh, expect above pilot, most likely comparable to Highlander, uh, in terms of overall projected reliability. Uh, the last few years running, uh, Hyundai and Kia have actually beat Toyota in terms of, of initial reliability. So 
one would expect that longer term reliability will eventually follow that same trajectory. So probably right there with the Highlander. Let's see here. Would I recommend a Dodge Dart 2.4 or Chrysler 203.6 for a teen driver? I'm assuming we're talking about the very last generation 200. I actually liked that car, um, strangely enough. I liked the 200, especially with the 3.6 liter V6. Um, I have to say that my biggest complaint with it was that it, it was too expensive. It sold relatively well. If it was a lot cheaper, I think it would have sold even better. But overall, for a teen driver, I would say that's not a bad choice. But I would add that to that, the caveat, that if you're looking at a car for a teen driver and you're buying a new car, then I would look at a new car with the latest in autonomous safety features. So uh, make sure you get uh, autonomous braking with pedestrian detection, cyclist detection if you can. Um, also get blind spot monitoring and make sure you get a backup camera. So um, those features definitely make driving safer for everybody, not just the teen that's in the car. Um, but it also means that your insurance rates could be less. So if you're shopping for a car, consult your insurance company, ask them what your insurance rate would be on an older Chrysler 300 that may not have had those features versus something like a... Uh, a new Honda HRV or even something along the lines of a, a Toyota Corolla um, that would have those features standard in every trim, including the less expensive models. See what the insurance rate would be. You may be surprised. You may get a better rate uh, on that that overall with the um, uh, with the more modern car. Also remember that um, teens are very likely to have accidents. And so those very first uh, fender benders, um, very first at fault accidents, you may prevent them if you uh, if you get something with an autonomous braking system on it. Let's see here, SR Turbo Sentra for 2020. Supposedly we will still have one because we have one now. Um, it is uh, not gonna change for 2020 basically. Besides the Model 3, what would be the closest direct replacement for a 2017 i3 BEV a 94 amp hour? Want something that's quirky and won't be common sight. Um, Quirky, 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 quirky. Your best bet for quirky might be something like the upcoming 2020 Soul EV, but it's be, pardon me, it's been delayed, unfortunately, due to the battery shortage worldwide. Um, but we're told that it should be shipping to the U.S. later this year, probably October, November, December. Uh, we don't have any videos for the Dodge Grand Caravan. That is true because the Caravan is definitely pretty old. Um, I probably reviewed it before I started videoing. Uh, let's put it that way. Let's see here. Uh, moving along, 2.4 engine from FCA, worst engine ever, but it's also okay for a teen. Um, yeah, the 2.4 from FCA is pretty slow. Depending on the car that it's in, it's not necessarily horrific, but, you know, it's, it's some engine. Um, what was my first press car? Uh, I think it was a Jaguar XF. I think might have been a Jaguar XF or a Volvo V70. My memory's a little sketchy on that one. Let's see here. All the turbos coming out generally the same, or are there differences? Um, generally speaking, most turb most modern turbo designs are very similar. Um, not everybody makes their own turbos, so we're even turbos are shared between uh, various different models. Um, as far as functional differences, let's let's go that way instead of obviously they're not direct copies of one another, but functionally they're very similar. Most modern turbos are intercooler designs. Um, in fact, I cannot think of any modern turbo that doesn't have an intercooler. Um, most turbocharged new engine designs also are direct injection. Um, so on that front, yes, very similar. Uh, let's see here. I've heard about shift problems with the ISIN eight speed front wheel drive transmission in the Camry and other Toyotas. Uh, I have heard of complaints. I haven't heard of problems. Let's put it that way. So that transmission, the ISIN 8-speed, has been around for some time. It was first launched in the RX 350F Sport, the previous generation model. Um, and it's also the same 8-speed transmission that we see in just about every modern Volkswagen with an 8-speed, Volvo, uh, BMW that's front-wheel drive, X1, X2, etc., um, we also see that in uh, a wide variety of European cars in the European market um, and even in some uh, General Motors vehicles. General Motors has purchased the ISIN 8-speed before. Um, <clears throat> basically, with that transmission, we do have a, a decent track record for it. And I think that Toyota shoppers are just complaining about the way that it shifts rather than a true problem with it. 
I haven't noticed any issues myself, but there's definitely more gear hunting since there are more gears available. Um, and Toyota has definitely programmed those, those transmissions to be very eager to upshift in order, in order to help improve overall fuel economy. So that is important to keep in mind there. Uh, let's see here. Deciding between, oh, I think we have already answered that particular question. Uh, even though 300S and Camcord are very different cars, uh, what's the better deal? I would say deal. I would find. I would say 300 is probably the better deal. Um, uh, you're saying that you found the grip disappointing. I would say replace the tires. Uh, replace the tires. Relatively comparably equipped. Overall handling is definitely going to be uh, better, I think, in the 300 in terms of overall feel. Absolute grip is not necessarily going to be that much better, but overall feel is definitely going to be better in a rear-wheel drive vehicle. Uh, let's see here. Uh, uh, Lucid is vaporware. I don't know about Lucid. I haven't heard too much about their financial situation. So, um, but a lot of a lot of EV car startups definitely seem to be having problems there. Uh, we'll see how they go. I think other than Tesla, Rivian probably has the best bet because they've got so much investment there. Uh, let's see here. I'm de deciding between. Oh, again, we have our problem here with the uh the chat window gotta scroll back sorry about that well we won't if anybody's i've missed this question sorry about that we have it's been lost here uh let's see here info on the wrangler three liter diesel engine availability yes we do have uh availability info on that we are told to expect that engine uh around fall or winter 2019 so it's going to be a little bit later uh, it is probably, although FCA said that they're still deciding on this, it is probably going to be available in the Wrangler first and then in the Ram pickup trucks. Um, most likely I will be driving it in the Ram pickup first, however. Uh, what do we think of the Chrysler Voyager 2020? That's a rebadge Pacifica, so if you're looking for something a little bit less expensive, that's an interesting option there. Uh, majority of FCA products are German or Italian-based platforms. Uh, that is definitely true. So, um, but remember again that when it comes to platform sharing, um, we're not talking about direct parts sharing. So the Chrysler 300, for instance, is an E-Class sort of thing that started out as a Mercedes E-Class, but got stretched to S-Class proportions. Um, so it doesn't really share anything directly with the E-Class, especially anymore. Uh, what is that thing on the wall near the captain's wheel? Oh, this thing. This is a float for a water tank. So uh, in the uh, in the area of the rural America that I live in, we're obligated to keep water for fire storage, uh, for firefighting rather, and we're upgrading our tank system to 20,000 gallons. And uh, the tanks are almost in place now. We just have leveled off the area, um, almost there. So that is going to go into one of the tanks and will control the level of the, the tanks in the system. But because I don't have a lot of room at home, it has been sitting on my wall, which is also why I have a stainless steel elbow and a two inch ball valve. So, you know, hey, why not? Um, <clears throat> with that out of the way, let's move on here. Uh, thoughts on the new Audi Q3. I'm really excited about that one. Hopefully we'll be able to get our hands on it soon. Although I don't know if we'll be invited to the launch event. Um, I'm really interested to see how that is because I liked the last generation Q3. It handles incredibly well. So I'm hoping that that continues in the Q3. And I do like the interior design also uh, in that model. Uh, pricing also looks pretty good. Let's see here. On a dual clutch transmission, do the clutches need to be replaced like on a five speed? Yes, they will eventually need to get replaced, whether we're talking about a wet clutch or a dry clutch dual clutch transmission but most likely they will outlive your car. The reason for that is the robots doing the shifting, <coughs> pardon me, and um, and so therefore the clutch is gonna have a longer lifetime because it's not gonna be slipping the clutch in the same way that you would if you were driving a regular transmission vehicle. Uh, thanks for whoever just uh, donated us $20 on the live chat thing here. If anybody wants to give us cash, you can do that down there. <coughs> I should also at this point say, if you haven't found us over at facebook.com slash alexandautos, you should go ahead and do that there because we will be having some prize giveaways. We have a bunch of things here that I will show you. Uh, we have two Harman Kardon Citation 1 uh, widgets with the built-in Google Assistant uh, and music speakers. So I've got one in black. 
and I have one in white or silver right over here. So those are available. I also have, I also have a small backpack. That's going to be in our next giveaway. I have some random hats. I don't know where all those came from. There's a Jeep one. There's a Mazda one. There's a Knight, a Michelin one. There's all that there. There's what I think is a thermos. Sounds like a thermos. Uh, and then a USB drive? I don't know. Something along those lines. Probably a USB drive for a Mazda. There's another Jeep hat right there. And we have more thermoses, another Mazda thermos, and a Toyota Supra thermos, in case anybody is interested in that little guy. So all of these will shortly be uh, available via a uh, raffle drawing thing uh, for all of our Facebook fans. So if you have not found us over at facebook.com slash alexnatos, go ahead and head over there. Uh, probably next week, there will be a link where you can enter the contest to win one of these little guys. No purchase necessary. Just toss your name in the hat. Eventually, names will be picked out of the hat, and then we will send these all on to you. Uh, the only caveat is you do have to be in the continental United States. We'll expand that to Alaska and Hawaii, sorry. In, in the U.S. or a related territory that is a U.S. Postal Service deliverable address. Um, unfortunately, we have had a few people that have won from South America, and while I desperately love our South American fans, Shipping there was astronomically expensive, so I don't think we're going to be doing that again. So, uh, if you live in the U.S. or a related U.S. territory, then be sure and join us over there, uh, and uh, you will be able to get your hands on some goodies. We probably also will have some Alex and Otto shirts. Uh, I don't think it'll be that one, but we do have one of those available. Um, we also have some t-shirts, etc., um, and of course, if you want stickers, there is a link down there in the description where you can send us a self-addressed envelope right like that one right there. So you send us this envelope, you put your address on it, put a stamp on it so that way I can actually get it to you, fold it up, put it in an envelope, and you mail it to us at the address that's down there in the descriptions. It's a P.O. box in Redwood Estates, California and then we will send you a sticker. Uh, if you want a schnazzier sticker, that is reserved for our members. These are some lovely uh, 3D uh, stickers that you can stick somewhere else. You also get to see our videos early. So lovely 3D stickers right like that. I don't know if you can see that there. Anyway, those are available to our members. Um, why are we doing memberships? The reality is sadly that YouTube revenue is on a perpetual decline. So every view is worth less and less than it ever was before. And uh, again, there are employees here. Sadly, this is a business and we must make money. Otherwise we will not survive. Uh, rents are expensive in California. And um, so that's why we're doing that. But we promise that nothing's changing on the regular channel. Um, so unfortunately the membership is not worth that much. That's. <laughs> That sounds sad. I shouldn't say that um, because all you get in the membership are the stickers and you get to watch the videos early and you get to pat yourself on the back for helping us out here. So that's basically it. Um, now, my second thought here, which is probably against the terms of service on YouTube. I don't know. Maybe I'm breaking the rules here, but um, I would say that you should never, ever, ever do YouTube Red because if you pay for YouTube Red so that you can escape the commercials, um, then we don't get much money here at all at Alex Nauto. So you pay $5, $10, whatever it is for YouTube Red a month, um, then that, that payment, most of it goes to YouTube and then a teeny tiny little fraction comes to every video creator that you've watched. So if you pay that, that money into their system, they're making a lot of money. Um, but my revenue gets drastically cut down. So, um, I think half, half or a quarter of a percent of our revenue comes from YouTube red viewers, but YouTube red viewers account for more than 20% of the people watching. So that should tell you how that cash ends up there. So anyway, let's move along there. Uh, what do we think the best car for the teenager for modern teenager is in my opinion, I would say anything that you like that afford that works in your budget that has the latest in modern safety systems. So, uh, for a teenager, I would say, um, whatever, whatever fits your family and, and your teen, etc. but also has, um, autonomous braking with pedestrian detection. And I would say full speed range autonomous braking too. make sure that you get that particular feature, um, lane keeping assistance, 
Um, and then you can go into some of the secondary ones. If you really want to geofence your child, know where they are at all times, that sort of thing, you can get some of those features secondarily. Um, and more and more manufacturers are offering that kind of feature in their vehicles. But I would say absolutely critically in my mind um, would be some of those those autonomous and semi-autonomous safety features right there, right up front. Uh, let see your thoughts on Toyota putting more power in the RAV4. Um, I don't think Toyota's going to be putting any more power in the modern RAV4. The reality is the RAV4 is one of the best-selling vehicles in America. And it's doing that without a V6 engine, without a turbocharged engine. So in Toyota's mind, why would you bother spending the R&D effort to uh, change something that's already a success? That would be the big reason, I think, that they wouldn't do anything there. Uh, let's see here. Someone is having problems with the Chrysler Pacifica, a uh, car turning off while driving. Um, is this a regular Pacifica or a Pacifica hybrid? I guess let us know down there in the com. Oh, hybrid Pacifica. Ah, okay. Uh, I guess the question would be, what has the dealer said? I haven't heard of that particular problem with the Pacifica hybrid. Um, have they have they have they looked at it? Uh, I'd be interested to know. Let us know what you see, what what's uh, what what you find down there, and our editor will attempt to uh, keep track of that. <coughs> oh, pardon me. <coughs> Uh, let's see here. Is there a three row crossover available with second row bench in the top trim level? Yes, that would be the Volkswagen Atlas. Um, and that's part of why I think that the Atlas is one of our top family picks here at Alex Nottos. We're actually going to have a video on the Atlas next week that will cover that a refreshed video on the Atlas. Uh, since we've driven all the other new entries, Volkswagen contacted us, strangely enough, out of the blue, and said, we'd like you to uh, take a look at the Atlas again. And I said, sure, hey, why not? Because it is one of our favorites here. So uh, it's still one of our favorites. It's not my top, top pick overall. I'd say that overall, uh, I would I would probably take the Telluride or the Palisade as my top overall pick in the three-row crossover segment. Um, but honestly, there are a ton of great choices in the three-row crossover segment, depending on what you're after. Uh, if you're after towing ability, that would be the Durango. If you're after the fun factor, I think that would be the new Ford Explorer ST. It also happens to be a pretty good deal. If you're looking for the best base model value and the least expensive with all-wheel drive, that would be the Subaru Ascent. If you're looking for the most fuel efficient, that's going to be the new 2020 Highlander. Uh, we haven't driven it yet, but I can tell you already that's most likely going to be the absolute best fuel economy in this segment. Uh, and when it comes to family friendliness, without question, that is the Volkswagen Atlas. Part of that is because we have a bench seat in all trims, including the top end trim. Uh, now, unfortunately, it only seats seven, so it's not going to give you an eighth seat in the back like we do see in the Highlander or the Pilot, but it is great for uh, seven passengers. The second thing and most critical thing for family friendliness is that you can leave a child seat latched into place in all three second row positions and still tilt and slide those seats forward to get into the third row. And I think that's really disappointing that the Ascent, the Palisade, the Telluride, uh, the Explorer, um, running blanks here and what else has come up recently, uh, none of those offer that same functionality. If you want to leave a child seat latched into the second row in your three row crossover, you have three options in America. <clears throat> we have the CX-9, which allows you to do it on one seat. Uh, the Nissan Pathfinder also allows you to do it on one seat. And then we have the Atlas, which allows you to do it in three seats. Definitely a, a strong improvement there. Everybody else leaves you to either try and climb through the middle of the captain's chairs if you get that option, or if you get the bench seat, you just have to try and squeeze between the door and the second row seat. That's not a very, uh, not a very comfortable option. Um, or you end up having to get a minivan because minivans will do that too. Uh, but uh, only the Chrysler Pacifica, I should say. Um, so really very few options for that child seat friendliness here. Let's move along here. Uh, which Toyota is shorter, Highlander or Sienna? The Highlander is definitely shorter overall. Uh, moving along here. GX460 used to offer a second row bench, made them captain's chairs. Uh, I believe that they still offer a second row bench, but the GX is not really a crossover. It's a body on frame style SUV. So not really the same sort of thing there in that, that category. Uh, when will we get a chance to review the Aviator? I certainly hope soon. I really don't know whether Lincoln's going to invite us to that event or not. We did get invited to uh, the Explorer launch event, but um, that doesn't necessarily translate over to Lincoln. Uh, is Ford still planning on discontinuing cars? Yep, they sure are. Uh, the Dodge Caliber and Mitsubishi Lancer share a wheelbase. Do they have more parts shared? Um, 
Yes, there were a few very rare, very, very minor parts that were likely shared between those two vehicles. Not a whole lot, though. Most of the vehicles were unique, although they shared some design components. Didn't really share parts, parts. Um, let's see. Maybe BMW X5 will fit three in a second row. Uh, yes, but remember that the BMW X5 appears to be having its third row canceled. A lot of different conflicting details on whether or not the X5's third row is actually canceled or not. Um, BMW has been a little cagey on this as well. Dealers have said yes. BMW themselves have said, well, not yet, but that wasn't really a no. So um, we may not see it for 2020. Details are still sketchy there. Uh, moving along here, any word on the touchscreen coming to the Lexus models besides the RX? Uh, you can bet that it probably will, but how long it will take is another matter. Um, Toyota has very long design cycles and they definitely don't go with the European model of updating a, uh, a system or a component that is interchangeable and then running it through the rest of the product line, um, like we see with BMW or Mercedes or, or Audi, etc. cetera. Um, so you probably won't see that in other Lexus models until it's time for a refresh. Let's see here. <clears throat> is the Toyota Sequoia older than the desert I live in? Probably. GLI versus GTI GLI. Um, someone's looking to buy a Stinger. What are thoughts on reliability for overall in the car? Stinger has been pretty reliable. Kia, again, has been very reliable in terms of reliability. They've, they've managed to beat Toyota and Honda for several years running in initial reliability. Long-term reliability, it depends because we aren't taking a look at... There's no way to, there's no way to know about long-term reliability on a car that's a year old. Let's put it that way. Um, but based on the numbers, our expectations are that their reliability is continuing to improve. We can see that in the initial reliability scores. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and say that it's probably going to be a, a very reliable option. Um, now, tur the Stinger does have turbocharged engines. Generally speaking, any turbocharged engine is going to be less reliable very long term than a naturally aspirated engine. So um, Kia Stinger versus, say, a Lexus that is naturally aspirated, probably the Lexus is going to be more reliable long term. Um, Kia Stinger versus a European vehicle that's turbocharged, Kia Stinger is probably going to be more reliable. Um, oddly enough, Stinger versus the average American rear wheel drive car, Stinger is probably going to be more reliable there as well. So moving along here, let's see here. Dual clutch transmission, the Golf GTI, Mercedes A220, feel jerky or refined? Um, any dual clutch transmission, even the best among them, are still going to feel less refined than a traditional automatic. Um, the closest in terms of refinement that I have ever experienced is in the latest Audi products. So their new longitudinal uh, wet clutch, dual clutch transmission, that transmission does have a feel that is very, very close to a traditional automatic. It's probably the smoothest one I've ever experienced, um, but there are a few downsides. The major downside is the fuel, uh, fluid life interval. So uh, most modern Audis and some of the Volkswagens as well um, you're supposed to change the transmission fluid every 40,000 miles. That can get a little expensive. Uh, most traditional automatics will have a 100,000 mile plus fluid lifetime at this time. Uh, let's see here. What's the difference between 3.2, 3.6 and 3.2 Pentastar? The 3.2 Pentastar was designed for other world markets primarily initially. Um, and uh, there's really not much difference functionally between the two engines. Um, pardon me. <clears throat> FCA invested the money in reducing the displacement on that particular engine. That's why they've hung out with it for so long. They also decided they wanted to try and differentiate the product line a little bit, having the Cherokee with a 3.2 and the Grand Cherokee with a 3.6. Personally, I think it was a little bit silly, um, but functionally, they're, they're very, very similar engines. A lot of the same basic building blocks are there in those two engines. Um, there's also, as I recall, a three liter version of that engine for other world markets as well. Uh, let's see here. Someone is looking at a Land Rover Discovery versus a Jeep Wrangler Sahara. Which one would I choose? Ooh, that's a tricky, weird pick. Uh, I don't know. Uh, a lot of people seem to like the Wrangler. It's definitely a very different kind of vehicle with the removable windows, removable doors, etc. Um, I would probably tend to go for the Land Rover Discovery because I like the luxury feel of that one a little bit better. Um, but that's really, I think that's really more of a, a personal uh, choice there. Let's see here. Volt theoretically discontinued. Yes, uh, supposedly it has been discontinued. Last Volt came off the line March or April, something like that. Uh, we don't know whether it's coming back or not, um, but there are still plenty on the dealer lot. So if you want one, you will probably get a good deal on one as well. Uh, let's see here. 
Uh, Clarity, the best PHEV. What about the Pacifica? The Pacifica is a pretty good plug-in hybrid as well, I would say, overall. Um, fuel economy is decent, but it's a very different kind of vehicle. You'd have to want a minivan, I would say. So I think the overall uh, desirability factor is higher with the Clarity. Let's put it that way. Uh, let's see here. Golf R versus Stinger. Uh, I think that's what this person is asking here. I would probably stinger over Golf R. Uh, how long till hydrogen fueling stations are available throughout the United States? I would say we don't know. It could be never. Um, it's definitely not going to be in the short term, uh, I would say. Um, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe 10 years. Right now they exist in California. They exist in Hawaii. Uh, they exist in uh, British Columbia. And there are some going into the Toronto metro area, as I understand it now. Um, it's really very, very early on this one. We know that there's a big push in terms of hydrogen fuel cell technology in Asia. So especially in South Korea, uh, Japan was really leading hard on this. And then South Korea said, hold my beer and then really ran with this. And they're putting massive amounts of government pressure and government money, most importantly, behind hydrogen. Um, and if anybody can make it succeed, I think it's going to be South Korea because they're putting so much cash on the line in this. Um, and the government has, uh, has a, a seemingly good ability to try and get Hyundai, uh, to do something with this. So they've, they've put out this huge initiative. They've put out a lot of money and they've also instructed Hyundai for lack of a better word, or incentivized Hyundai to put a lot of cash on their own, uh, behind their fuel cell push. <clears throat> so what does that mean for America? We don't really know. Um, it's possible that some of the other states that follow California's air emissions laws may jump on the hydrogen bandwagon. If we see a spread in the U.S., <clears throat> that's probably going to be it. It could be from states like Oregon, which is bordering on California. Um, it could be from a state like Nevada, uh, because people from the Southern California area may want to go to uh, Las Vegas in their hydrogen vehicle. Um, it could be from Arizona, perhaps, because that is drivable from California. So a lot of a lot of moving parts there. We don't really know. Uh, let's see here. What's it like filling with hydrogen? How much does a gallon of hydrogen cost? At the moment, nothing. The hydrogen is included with every purchase or lease of a hydrogen vehicle, um, and that will get you about sixty to 80,000 miles, depending on which vehicle you buy. Um, theoretically, a hydrogen vehicle would be about 50 to 100% more expensive than a gasoline hybrid vehicle to run if you had to pay for the hydrogen yourself. Um, at the moment, California is claiming that the target price for a kilogram of hydrogen is $5 a kilogram, current price $15 a kilogram. So if hydrogen gets down to around seven or $8 a kilogram, something like that, then overall cost of operation would be relatively on par with a hybrid midsize sedan, something along those lines. Let's see here. Moving along here. Someone has a five-year-old Highlander. Should I get a Palisade, Telluride, or a Highlander? I would say it depends on how much room you want inside. <clears throat> if you're looking for a very roomy vehicle, especially for third row passengers, Palisade and Telluride have an absolutely enormous amount of room compared to the Highlander. We have a uh, massive amount of uh, storage space behind the third row. We also have up to eight inches more leg room uh, than you'll find in the Highlander. And that's a really big deal for the third row passenger. Uh, significantly more headroom as well. And the seat is not as close to the ground. Um, so if you need the room, I would say either of those two options. However, fuel economy is, is pretty average for that segment. It's unimpressive. 21 miles per gallon is good. Generally speaking, it's better than an Atlas. It's better than, um, a, a number of the older entries there, but it's not stellar. Um, and if you want stellar fuel economy, that's going to be in the new 2020 Highlander hybrid. Um, but you will have to get that hybrid model there for that. That's moving along here. Uh, I've read from multiple reviews. 2018 Stinger has many rattles. Is 2019 any better? Uh, I have heard a few complaints about that. Motor Trend said that most of theirs were addressed um, in the production version. Uh, so according to the folks at Motor Trend, uh, the Stinger that they had for their long-term review was a pre-production or early production model. Supposedly, a lot of these have been fixed. So that I don't know. Um, 
One thing that I do know and I can say for sure is that the Stinger is not going to be as rigid as the G70 or the G80 because it's a lift back and you have that huge hole in the back of the vehicle. So anytime you make a, a hatchback or a minivan, that sort of shaped vehicle, uh, something without true true full wraparound D pillars and a, and a trunk opening in a traditional sense, you're going to have a less uh, a less rigid vehicle overall. So let's see here. Um, <clears throat> Do we think Nissan will improve their CVT technology? Uh, I haven't heard much on, on Jatco's transmissions. Jatco is their transmission manufacturer. They make CVTs for other companies as well. Haven't really seen too much as far as uh, CVT improvements from them. The main thing that we've seen out of Jatco is trying to expand the ratio spread. So CVTs with two speed transmissions inside. Um, we'll see how that goes. Probably nothing for the next few years here, I would see. Let's see here. Uh, any more info on the 2021 Tundra Hybrid powertrain? I will believe the Tundra Hybrid when I see it. Let's put it that way. Uh, it's possible, and I hope that it will be there. But I, I just am, I'm a little bit pessimistic on that one. Let's see here. Uh, what do we? Why do we think Infinity sales are going down this year? I think it's because Infinity's, um, Infinity's product line is not exactly fresh. Um. Uh, we're nearing in the 4.30 time period here, so let's start to pick a few of our last questions here. Um, let's see here. Nissans are usually fun, but when they get old, they start to fail, part turn into money pits. Uh, haven't heard too much on that one. Reliability for Nissan has been a little on the average side. So it's de if you're coming out of a Toyota and you're expecting Toyota reliability out of your less expensive Nissan, that's probably not the most rational thought. Um, but if you're coming out of an American car, you may find higher reliability in the Nissan. Uh, you'll definitely find a really great deal at the dealer. So, you know, the Nissan's going to be less expensive than the Toyota. Generally speaking, also more fuel efficient than some of the comparable models out there. So remember that you're, you're paying for a less expensive vehicle. So you should expect um, some differences in the overall experience there. Will the 2020 Volkswagen Tiguan get a better power plant? No, it's looking like there aren't going to be any changes for the Tiguan or the Atlas for 2020. Uh, is it true that Murano has been on the same platform since 2003? It has definitely been around for a long time. So yes, it is definitely not a spring chicken. I don't think it's 2003 though. This generation of the Murano theoretically is different than that first generation of Murano, but they're not, they're not far off in terms of overall relations. That's not necessarily a bad thing per se. Uh, let's see here. But in reality, you see a majority of families owning a Highlander, a Pilot, and then a Pathfinder. And you know, Scotty Kilmer would argue about the Pathfinder. Well, you know, Scotty Kilmer would argue with a with uh, with anything. He'd argue with a corpse. Um, so you know, I don't know if I could uh, take that as anything in particular here. Uh, are there any other new three-row PHEV crossovers coming out later this year other than the Aviator? No. So it does not appear to be uh, anything in the pipeline as far as plug-in three rows. Um, three row electric vehicles we have probably not in the next year but uh, we have the model y which is gonna have a little teen tiny third row uh late availability we have the rivian in late 2020 um and that's about it as far as confirmed things um plug-in hybrids are just they're not a lot of them out there not a lot of companies seem to be investing too much in that particular category at the moment um and the three row vehicles uh, there's definitely some packaging and weight concerns around putting a bigger battery pack in there. So I think that's the big reason there. Uh, let's see here. So someone's asking about the the smoothness of the Ford Explorer's drivetrain. Could it become annoying in suburban driving? Um, the Explorer in regular form, I thought was okay. We were driving pre-production models that promised to smooth out the 10-speed automatic. We definitely have seen some smoothness improvements in the 10-speed over the course of the F-150's lifetime in the US. Um, the hybrid is more my concern. The hybrid definitely was not the smoothest thing out there. And on that one, I'm gonna have to wait until we get our hands on a production model. So hopefully that will be over the next uh, two to three months or so that we'll be able to find a production Highlander hybrid. Um, after a lot of quizzing, Ford said that that was running a pre-production software build. Hopefully that is true because it was definitely not as smooth as any of the other plug-in hybrids out there or, or hybrids out there that have used that same style hybrid system. So keep your fingers crossed and stay tuned. 
Um, any news in the next generation Mazda 6? Nope, nothing new there. You can bet that that's probably going to be after the CX-5, however. Uh, so your Nissan Versa news, that's coming later this year. So we will be driving that. I think we already know uh, that that's going to be September, late September, early October, something like that there. Uh, Genesis G70, is it worth the money for compact luxury sedan? I like it. It's a good, good version. It's a good, good deal there uh, overall. What do we think about the Altrac versus the Outback? They're two very differently sized vehicles. So the Altrac is a compact wagon. The Outback is a mid-sized wagon. So that's the biggest difference between the two. Um, the Altrac is a little bit neater, a little bit tidier handling, but at this point in time, it's definitely going to feel old versus the new Outback. The new Outback has uh, all of their latest whiz -bang features. Uh, it's going to come with a lot of active safety technology standard. It's a little bit more comfortable, a little bit softer feeling. Um, it also is going to be a little bit more powerful with the turbocharged engine more likely than not. Um, and we have that massive touchscreen in the dashboard there. Uh, do we know anything about a newly designed charger? Nope, there's going to be no change there for a while. So, uh, and why would there be when Chrysler is selling so many of them without uh, without changing a darn thing? Um, they've just released a wide body charger. So that's really telling us that there's not going to be much of a change probably for the next two years or so. Um, there's been a lot of talk about it, but I don't think we're going to see anything here soon. Uh, when will Mazda change their aging six speed? We're being told the 12th of never. Um, the big reason for that is that Mazda already has a six speed paid for. Um, and they keep claiming that they're, they're targeting fuel savings in different areas rather than the transmission ratios. Uh, I really wish they would replace it because I would like to see a Mazda with, uh, with an eight speed automatic transmission. It would help improve fuel economy, it would probably help improve acceleration. Um, but their six speed transmission has been pretty reliable overall. Uh, the R&D has been long since paid for and they build it themselves. Those are the big reasons that we see it in that particular model. Uh, let's see here. Uh, how do we arrange with, with companies to get all the cars to review? Um, we basically have to contact the various car companies, say, can we review this? Can we review that? And then it's a lot of calendar work to get those on the schedule. So uh, that is a little bit complicated there. Uh, let's see here. Jeep Cherokee or Ford Escape? Uh, Off-road ability Cherokee. I do like the new Ford Escape that looks really, really interesting. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to drive that probably in the next three months is what I'm being told around there. So keep your fingers crossed. Uh, thoughts on the highway driving feature by Hyundai. That's basically just Acura's lane, sense, lane centering technology. It operates very similar to what we see uh, in the latest Acura and some of the European models, um, where instead of lane keeping assist bouncing you like a ping pong ball off the sides, it's just gonna try and, and give you a more gradual forced increase as you get closer to the line to try and keep you in the center. So think of it as like a ball in a raceway. So if you're right in the center of the raceway, there's not a lot of force acting on the ball, but the closer you get to the side, the harder it is to get out of the tray into the next lane, if that would make sense. So that's the, the method they're looking for there. Uh, and with that, let's take our one last question here. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Let's see here. What is better off-roading for runner or land cruiser? Oh, that's an interesting last question. Uh, Forerunner, I would generally say, mainly because of the weight. So remember that weight is the enemy off-road and on-road both. Uh, and the Land Cruiser is pretty darn heavy these days. So I would probably want the Forerunner if I was going to do any serious off-roading there at all. Um, and, you know, the Forerunner, both of them have a lot of, a lot of aftermarket parts available but it's probably going to be less expensive to modify your 4Runner if you really did want to do some serious off-roading as well. Um, and then we have the TRD version of the 4Runner also, which gives you some of that next level up uh, in terms of off-roading ability from the factory with a factory warranty. So if you're looking to go visit an off-road park uh, on occasion, um, or you live a little bit off the beaten path and you might want to go you know, camping somewhere a little bit more rugged uh, on a regular basis, you'll be able to do that on the Forerunner and still have that comfort of the factory warranty behind all those parts in that particular model. So uh, our next live show theoretically will be next Friday. So stay tuned for that. It should be at the same bat time, same bat channel. And again, if you want to uh, uh, enter the raffle for some of these giveaways, we have this large collection here, and you live in the United States or any of the outlying territories, then be sure to head over to facebook.com slash alexandautos. Like us, follow us over there. Um, you can also become a member down there and get some updates on that sort of thing. And uh, we will then see you next week.